So welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to my presentation, how ARM systems are booted, an introduction to the ARM boot flow. I'll start with a slide about myself. My name is Ruven Sevinsky, and I work for Pengutronics. Um, uh, you can find me under the and there's also in the Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? 
Okay, can any, everybody hear me? Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> then we can start now. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to my talk, How ARM Systems Are Booted, an introduction to the ARM boot flow. Um, a short slide about me. My name is Ruben Sawinski. I work for Pengotronics EK. Um, you can find me on GitHub under Imantor, and the email address is on there. So if you have any questions afterwards and you don't know how to contact me, just download the slides, write me an email, I'll answer eventually. If, it's, if the mailbox isn't too full, obviously. Um, I started at Pengutronics doing testing for embedded systems and developed um, a testing framework called LabGrid. Then I worked a bit on Opti, the Open Platform Trusted Execution Environment, did a bit of system integration, just bundling libraries into a complete Linux systems for customers. And now I'm working with media systems, so cameras and video interfaces. But at Pengutronics, we also do a lot of low-level work. So we have a fork of U-Boot, which is called Bearbox and we deploy Bearbox in production for customers, and that's why I also do bootloader stuff or work on bootloaders actively. I'll start with a short disclaimer. So this talk is not how ARM systems are booted. This talk is how some of the ARM systems are booted, mostly looking at the IMX8M variants. And you have to totally consult your vendor documentation because your vendor, vendor might have decided to do everything totally different from what I am presenting here today. Because for embedded Linux systems, there is no standardized boot flow, unfortunately. Um, for, our, for server systems, we have um, standardized on UEFI and ACPI. But for embedded systems, there is no st such standard yet. And I don't think that a standard is going to come up eventually because embedded systems can be very difficult or come in various shapes and sizes. And uh, it's hard to standardize something like this. Um, we are going to look at implementations, and implementations are always vendor specific. So you have NXP with the IMX series, which, the, uh, which do other stuff than NVIDIA does, or Qualcomm does, or Samsung does. And there's also a way which ARM used to standardize initially. So the whole ARM trusted firmware, which I'm going to talk about later, was an initiative by ARM to get a somewhat standardized system for ARM V8 or ARM 64-bit systems up and going. Um, I'm not going to look at ARM v7, so 32-bit systems today, because um, we have a lot more different implementations in that area of the code. There are vendor-specific kernel drivers for stuff like uh, turning a CPU on or getting a CPU to idle correctly. <coughs> and um, this is uh, a lot different from what we see in the ARM v8 world. <coughs> Um, ARMv8 has de facto standardized on ARM trusted firmware, and this is what I'm going to present today and what I'm going to talk about. So let's start with the short table of contents. We just went through the introduction. I'm just going to talk about exception levels on ARM processors uh, initially. I'm going to talk a bit of the, about the requirements we have for booting a system, so what is necessary to get a system up and running. Then I'm going to talk about the TFA and the TFA services, which are omnipresent on almost every ARM v8 or ARM 64-bit system. And then we're going to the kernel start sequence so we can finally end up in the kernel and finally, or eventually start user space to run our applications on the processor. Let's take a short look ex uh, at exception levels. So for most of the ARM 64-bit implementations, there are four different exception levels. And there's also a separation of the normal world and the secure world. I'm not going to talk about the secure world today because the secure world implementations are not necessary to boot up a system and run your own applications, but might be interesting for implementations like trusted storage, as an example. Um, we do use all the EL0 to EL2 exception levels in the normal world. And then we have exception level three, which is the highest exception level with uh, the most privileges, which is here uh, declared here as secure monitor. But for ARM64, I think the TFA runtime services name is more common. Um, in the normal world, exception level two is going to be occupied by something like a hypervisor. And exception level one is where your kernel runs. And exception level zero is what your application uses to run. We can also put this on a timeline during boot up. So we'll always start out in the highest exception level, which is exception level three. Um, then the ROM code is going to start. The ROM code is usually on your um, vendor implementation or is fused into your SOC. 
then an SPL or a second stage bootloader is going to start and we're going to start up the exception level three services. The exception level three services will then start the full, <laughs> full strength bootloader and uh, it will hand over to the kernel, which then provides hypervisor facil facilities if enabled and puts itself into exception level one. Finally, when the kernel is started up and our user, user space is available, we will run our application at exception level zero. There's also a slightly different naming scheme from the trusted firmware, ARM trusted firmware world, where the ROM is always equivalent to BL1, so bootloader one. The SPL is usually named bootloader two, and the EL3 services are bootloader three one. So the third stage, but the first part, which is going to run in um, exception level three permanently while your kernel is also running on the system. And then it's going to start the so-called, or what we know from the ARM 32-bit world, bootloader as bootloader 33. And then everything else is either taken up by the Linux kernel in the form of hypervisor and uh, OS kernel. And finally, we have an application layer, which is here named US for user space. Let's talk a bit about the first stage of our boot up process. We have the first stage, which is BL1 in the ARM trusted firmware speak. Um, which is the ROM code. And this is usually a mask ROM fused into your SOC. And if it requires memory, it uses some small SRAM, which is always available on your SOC. And this implements vendor specific storage access or next stage loading. So all the implementations I've seen so far have a specific firmware header, which declares um, I'm going to load from this address on the SD card or I'm going to load a specific address from the SD card and the firmware header contains further information where the next stage is going to be, either on the same SD card or maybe on an SPI flash or somewhere else. So this is very vendor specific and you need to consult the documentation about this. Um, ROM code usually also implements something like a USB upload or serial upload so you can do development on devices. Um, a very popular example of this is maybe the Nintendo Switch systems, which initially didn't have this mode disabled. That's why you can upload uh, your own firmware to the very early, uh, early release systems they sold on the market. Later systems had this uh, USB loading disabled, but for development this is really, really nice because you can hack on the bootloader and if it doesn't start, you can reset your SOC and then upload a working bootloader again. Um, for the ROM code, it's Almost always smaller is better because smaller means less size and less size in the end means less cost for the vendor. And we, want, we don't want to put unnecessary costs onto the SOC, so we try to make this as small, small as possible. It also implements same default settings. So it's going to enable some of the clocks, it's going to enable some of the power or all of the power, depending on the implementation, but it's going to be in a safe state. So it's probably going to use the minimum clock frequency to be stable, regardless of what power is provided externally, for example. This stage will then go on to load the next part of your bootloader system. And that is the second stage or BL2 in TFA speak. And this is either a part of the ARM trusted firmware or it might be an U-boot SPL or it may be a bare box pre-boot loader. We don't know, it's totally up to the implementation. But they all have in common that they are loaded by the first stage using the vendor specific header they read, the boot ROM read out. And they also need to set up the RAM in some form or another. Um, I know that older IMX uh, implementations, for example, contained the DDR training code within the firmware header. So there was no additional um, run training or ROM, uh, RAM training code that needed to be provided. But modern implementations of IMX8 use DDR4 firmware, uh, DDR4, and DDR4 requires a vendor specific implementation of code. So they are going to run training pattern live on the SOC to find the best values. And therefore, in this case, the training code needs to be um, embedded into your second stage bootloader. And um, this stage will then go on to load the next stage again from a storage median, or it may be compiled in into the binary already. That's up to you. 
and up to your implementation. And as I said before, the different boot, flow, boot flow flows from here can be, uh, we are going, we are a U-Boot SPL and we're just going to start TFA for the runtime services and then end up in U-Boot. The same is also true for Bearbox on IMX8. Bearbox will start the pre-boot loader and then start up the runtime services, end up in exception level two, exception le uh, one exception level lower, and then start the real Bearbox bootloader. Or you might also be using TFA as a bootloader level, uh, bootloader, uh, as a second stage bootloader, and then go into U-Boot or Bearbox. Um, I know that the ARM Juno reference implementation uses these, uh, or uses this bootloader scheme, but I don't know any other system which implements the TFA as bootloader 2 system at the moment, at least not on ARM64. Let's talk a bit about ARM Trusted Firmware. So ARM Trusted Firmware is a framework to implement standard firmware, uh, firmware services. Um, we have PSCI and SCMI, which I'm going to talk about later. And it's also an exception level three secure monitor and silicon provider router. And it's going to be explained on the next slide. And it can be used as BL2 and or a bootloader three dispatcher. So it's going to start up all the different binaries which are required to run on your SOC. It's going to start the exception level three runtime services. It's going to start up your secure world operating system or trusted execution environment, whatever needs to be started up there. And then it's going to pivot into a normal, um, normal world bootloader to start up um, your Linux kernel. It's MIT licensed, which is very, very nice for vendors because um, the source code of these binaries doesn't need to be available. Um, at least NXP on the IMX8 series also releases the source code, so you can do upstream work or add features to an upstream TFA, but at least on Rockchip, as far as I know, we currently don't have the untrusted firmware source code. So we can't modify the untrusted firmware. All we get is a pre-compiled binary, which obviously works because we can start the system, but makes debugging harder if we at some point find out that the bug we are chasing may be in the exception level three runtime services. So this license has kind of a dual-edged sort at this point. TFA provides silicon provider services. So these are implementation and SOC specific services. As an example on IMX8M, they expose their secure boot API this way and they also expose DDR frequency scaling. So if you want your DDR to downscale while the system is not in heavy use and you want to save power, that's done by calling into the ARM trusted firmware using the ARM SMC calling convention. And also um, NXP provides a way to sign your own binaries using their secure boot scheme um, to communicate with the on-chip ROM code on the SOC that you want to verify a specific binary blob you've signed before. This is also done using a silicon provider service because only the highest exception level on the system is allowed to call into the ROM code. Otherwise you'll get a fault and it won't work. And this is the reason why we require this uh, silicon provider services because the vendor has locked down the ROM code to only be called from exception level three. So how does this uh, communication work. Um, we do have two instructions which are used there, and these are the SMC and exception return instructions. Uh, we can see on the right-hand diagram that the normal world does an SMC, and it's going to end up either in the next highest exception level, or if the, uh, if the SMC call isn't trapped via a register or uh, via configuration, then it's going to end up in the exception level three firmware and the firmware can then decide where the call is going to be. Am I the one who provides the services? Is this a call into the ROM code or is it a call for our secure world operating system? It's going to side, uh, decide this based on uh, the arguments um, supplied on the registers when doing the SMC call. So all the communication doing um, the RM SMC calling convention is done by registers. You're going to put um, the, the call you want to do on the first registers and extra argument on other registers and then do, you do the SMC and either the call works and you're going to get a this call worked fine after the exception return from the higher exception level 
or your call went wrong and then it's, it'll indicate an error. But uh, there shouldn't be a case where your system hangs afterwards. One of the next services is PSCI. It's the, it's the power state coordination interface. Um, the power state coordination interface was initially invented because every implementation has a different way on how to start up a CPU. Some implementa implementations need more register accesses, some implementations um, need specific wait times, and implementing all these in the kernel turned, to be, turned out to be rather tedious because you had to go through all the kernel review systems. But with the TFA, you can now put your um, CPU startup sequence onto your TFA and you don't have to worry about uh, a review system in this case because um, the TFA is MIT licensed and you can just ship the binary Bob to your customers. In my opinion, the review process of the Linux kernel is very justified and uh, uh, it's very, very worth it. But uh, for vendors, it's far easier to put it into the ARM trusted firmware. And it's also a defined interface, which is always available um, for the kernel. So every SOC, ARM64 SOC implementation out there is almost, or almost all of them are using PSCI to enable CPU on, CPU off, system sleep, or CPU idle of the individual cores. So it somewhat lifts the complexity out of the kernel into the tr ARM trusted firmware. And it's standardized or somewhat standardized on ARMv8 systems. I know there are some ARMv8 systems out there which don't implement PSCI or SCMI. The Apple M1 SOCs come to mind. They don't implement the exception level three at all, but all embedded Linux ARM64 systems I know of implement these via PSCI and the ARM trusted firmware. And usage on ARM v7 is also possible. We have the STM32 processors out there which are using PSCI even on ARM32 bit systems. The next evolution in this series of lifting the complexity out of the kernel into the ARM trusted firmware is SCMI, which is the system control and management interface. And this not only um, provides a discoverable API for how do I turn on my CPU cores, it also provides a discoverable API for clocks and power. And the simple reason why that's required and we can't, can't only manage that on the kernel side is that this is useful since normal and secure world may require the same clocks. Um, as an example, if I have some kind of crypto accelerator on my system, which is used from the secure world and normal world, but the Linux kernel decides I'm not using the crypto accelerator at the moment. Might as well turn off the clocks to the accelerator to save power the secure world may want to use the controller in this case. And in this case, the SCMI service within the ARM trusted firmware will know the normal world doesn't need the crypto accelerator, but the secure world side does. So even if the normal world side wants to turn off the clocks, I'll not turn off the clocks in this case because it's currently used on the other side of the system. And this also again provides a simplified control interface for the Linux kernel. We only need to implement SCMI and the discoverable, uh, discoverable API, and we don't need to implement clock control, power control for every individual SOC. We'll just route everything um, through the TFA. I have a short excursion here, because if we want to boot up a Linux kernel, we need some kind of system to describe how or what hardware is available on the system. And we have many, many slightly different SOC versions out there. So you might have an MX8 processor, which is four cores, and all the usual peripheral hardware like media encoders, camera interfaces, accelerators, and so on. But there's also a slightly different variant, which is only two cores, so it's only a dual core. And the implementation for the Linux kernel is not to use or not to hard code this information into the kernel, it's done by writing device trees. Um, device trees are files which describe the individual hardware. In this case, on the right-hand side, we have an example here, which um, has an include line at the very top, which we also know from the C world, where we include a different file. In this case, we include the whole SOC hierarchy of an IMX8 MQ SOC, and then we add our custom implementation details to it. So in this case, the example was taken from the IMX8 MQ evaluation kit, 
and it's going to set up a model name to be easily identifiable if the user wants to look at the model name. Uh, it adds a compatible, so the kernel can do specific driver probing or specific patches for this evaluation kit hardware. And then lower down, we can see that we provide additional information for the FEC, which is the Ethernet controller. So we're going to set up some kin control handling, so which pins on the SOC are routed to which of the FEC hardware IP inputs. And uh, we are also going to say the PHY, which does the communication to the outer world, is connected by RGMII. And then we're going to provide a PHY handle and lower down under the MDIO bus connected to our Ethernet controller, we have an Ethernet PHY. And this is also described within the system. And um, this is also very, very useful because we not only have very many, many slightly different SOC versions, we also have shared components across SOC generations. So as an example, the IMX6 and IMX8 UARTs, so serial interfaces, are functionally totally equivalent. So there's no need to write an additional driver for this because we can reuse the existing driver. We're just going to add a new compatible. Maybe it's slightly broken in a different way. Then we can fix it in the driver via, via a tweak. And uh, then we can use the existing driver. That's one of the reasons why bring up of newer SOC generations often is a lot faster than an older generations where no previous driver was available. And this is also the case for some of the media encoding hardware. As an example, on the IMX8, there's a hardware encoder for JPEG, which can also be found on the rock chip, uh, on some rock chip SOC variants. And this is because vendors are not building every block on an SOC themselves. Um, a lot of the more difficult or more complex parts used on an SOC are often bought from, an, uh, from another vendor. So you will end up with SOCs who implement the same hardware blocks and then we can, on the Linux kernel side, reuse the same drivers. So finally, after going through, through the exception level three runtime services, we are going to end up in exception level two. And here our bootloader, in this case described here, Bearbox proper, is providing additional services. So none of the previous stages, as far as I know, implement anything like networking for or NFS boot, which is very, very convenient if I'm developing on a system. Um, the bootloaders also implement stuff like boot spec parsing, where, they, where we have a file on our file system or on NFS, which describes um, which kernel this system is compatible to. And then the system can just probe through all the entries in the boot spec file and decide, okay, I'm that system, I have that compatible, I'm just going to use that device tree and everything works uh, and boots up fine. The bootloaders also provide some kind of USB gadget or serial support. So in this case, Bearbox provides USB gadget for support for serial, so you can start up Bearbox, plug in micro USB via, um, or via USB OTG and then just connect via your normal computer without needing any additional serial adapters. It provides mass storage, so um, to the outer world, it's just going to look like a USB disk where you can drop files. Maybe you have a development kernel you want to upload to the system, and then you can drop it onto the mass storage device, and it's going to show up within Bearbox on your embedded system. Or we, uh, we also implement stuff like Fastboot, which is very convenient to upload a kernel or a complete file system using sparse support, which is then really nice and fast. Let's talk about a bit about kernel style. So we are now in BL33 or in Bearbox. What do we need to do to start our kernel? So the first thing we need to do is that we need to decompress the kernel. In older ARM 32-bit systems, the kernel had an internal decompressor, which was called bef before the kernel was started. But for ARM 64, for simplicity, it was decided to move the decompression into the bootloader. So all modern bootloaders implement the usual decompression algorithms to decompress the kernel and then put it into a memory location, which is defined in the kernel header. We also need to copy the device tree, or in this case, not the device tree description I showed before, which was the source description. We are going to copy a device tree binary into memory. 
Then we also need to mask interrupts. So our boot is not <laughs> interrupted by any device receiving Ethernet data or a timer interrupt firing. And we need to initialize the standard ARM timer to a default value, but keep its interrupts off. We are then going to put our kernel at a offset specified in the header. So um, this is somewhat um, specific to the system, but um, it's usually very close to the lower bounds of the RAM on the system. Um, we also need to disable our MMU if the bootloader enabled the MMU before. Um, usually the bootloaders, ena bootloaders enable the MMU because it's a lot faster to use the MMUs and um, uh, yeah, it needs to be uh, disabled before kernel start. And we also need to disable and flush the caches so there are no stale cache entries before starting up the system. And then we need to initialize our CPU registers either for EL2 or EL1, depending on which exception level we are actually in. And at the moment for ARM 64-bit, that's really easy. There's only one argument we need to put on register zero, and that's the address of our device tree binary or device tree blob in this case. And the very final thing we are going to do is to jump into the kernel. And then our kernel is going to start up, probe individual drivers, and go through the usual startup sequence. And now we can pray that Wi-Fi is kind to me, and I can show you a live demo of how this looks like. But it doesn't look like it. So unfortunately, due to... Uh, spotty Wi-Fi reception at the moment. It's not really possible to show the demo because I'm connecting to a system at home which has um, the relevant information on it. So, I'll slide show, start from current slide. So, this is as far as a general overview of the boot up system looks like and I'll be very, very happy to answer any questions which are open now. Otherwise, I have two other slides which go a bit into the secure world side of things. So if you do have any questions, please ask them now. I see a question over there. Do we have any microphones? Okay. Um, how is the access? Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. How is the access uh, to the uh, CPU registers limited uh, according to the exception levels? Is there some kind of limitation? Can you define? which CPU uh, registers can be accessed, uh, I mean the memory mapped registers, can be accessed from which exception level? Yes, so this is also vendor specific. Um, so for IMX8 systems or IMX8 M systems, there is something called the central security unit and uh, this defines policies based on exception level or whether your call is coming from the normal world or secure world. So this way, a system can decide that um, only exception level three can access this memory mapped uh, I.O. device. But it's SOC specific, so you need to consult your vendors or your vendor's documentation. And if that's eno not enough, you have to talk to your FAE. I was wondering why you need to run a uh, bare box at BL2 and not BL1. Um, um, BL1 is always, uh, do you have the uh, headphones on? Or, or you can hear me. Okay. Um, BL1 is always reserved for the ROM code. So we, in theory, could put our. BL, um, BL1, BL2. E, excuse me? I meant EL2, sorry. Sorry, I was meaning EL2. Ah, ah I see, That's I see. My mistake. So. Um, why do we need to run Bearbox at EL2? We don't need to run Bearbox at EL2. Our system may not implement EL2 at all. That's also possible. Um, the ARM spec leaves uh, a lot of freedoms to the systems, and we can totally run Bearbox on EL1 as well. 
we are not limited to EL2 in this case. Any more questions? If there aren't any more questions, thank you very much for coming to the talk. <laughs>